This video continues from the previous video. All right, so we have now built the walls up and we're ready to put on the roof. And one thing I want to point out here is most people don't realize is you see the gap in the roof where the, the plywood, they, they framed up the roof and they put down plywood and they put down felt and now they're putting down the shingles. But you see there's a gap right there, the big, big gap. That is so that is for ventilation. There's a, a roof, a ridge vent that's going to go up there. Now that you know that, you'll see it everywhere. You see the picture on the right with the tile. He's laying down a clay tile. Those roofs are much more popular out west. Um, that also will have a ridge vent going over the top of it, and there's a gap there. And what's going to happen is heat is going to collect in the roof, uh, in the attic, excuse me. Attic is not generally a conditioned space, and conditioned meaning air conditioned. It's generally not a conditioned space in uh, most houses. It's just empty space. And so what happens is because it's not being conditioned, the heat gain in both the summer and the winter, depending on where you live, it could be just as bad in the winter in some cases. Um, but the heat gain um, is going to, could cause structural damage, can do all kinds of damage up there. And so what we want to do is you're going to see on the soffit, and we'll talk about what that is shortly, um, we're going to want air to come in and come down and cool down and then the hot air rise out and up through that vent. And so we'll cover that with a cap so the rain can't get in. Um, we also have metal panel. Of all the roofing systems, um, asphalt has to be replaced more often. Architectural shingles, which is what those appear to be, and they have texture to them, they last a lot longer than, than regular shingles, but they're more expensive. And again, it's one of those things that I argue that it's more expensive up front, but it saves you money in the long run because you're replacing them less often and the labor can be expensive. Um, metal panels can last a hundred years and longer. So, um, they're very expensive and when it rains, you can hear the rain. So it just, you know, just kind of depends on a whole bunch of different factors when you're choosing whether to go with shingles, tile, metal panel, or, I mean, there's other things like wood. Um, I personally would not put wood on a roof just because of the whole wet dry thing. Um... But for a long time, that's all, you know, humans had to put on roofs. Uh, and here you can see there are different terminologies for, um, once again, everything has a, has a name um, for what we put on the roof and what we build up and put together and how it all comes and works. Um, and so these are two sections. If we were to slice through a building, pull it apart, and then just look at the roof, um, you can see, again, we've got different names for things. And so soffit is the underside of the eave. The eave is the part that overhangs from the wall. And the reason we do that is because when the rain comes along and goes in the gutter, but also it's going to sometimes run out of the gutter when it rains really, really hard and come down and drip. Um, and so this soffit prevents it from running on down the face of the building but also um, in the summer when the sun is really intense, the soffit, the overhang, allows the, the part of the roof to shield the windows, which again are the least insulated items in the house, from direct sunlight, which can create heat gain inside the house. So in climates that are really warm, these larger overhangs actually help prevent and protect the house from more heat gain. So this is what we talked about. This is a, a, a ridge vent, a soffit vent, where the air is going to come in and travel along the rafter. And you can see here showing and out of the ridge vent. And that helps keep the attic from becoming um, so hot that it does, starts to do to starts to do damage. Um, gutter we're familiar with. Fascia is the board that goes along the edge of the the ridge line. There you'll see, and it covers the end of the rafters. Um, 
So soffit, fascia, gutter, downspout form a system to protect the end of the roof where the roof and the walls meet. Again, you can see this is the fa uh, soffit, this is the fascia, gutter, and then you can see to the left, you know, what those, what those items cover, what those wood, or in this case, this looks like it's a, a, a siding, what those cover. And what it's trying to do is just kind of protect the exposed wood from the framing. And then there's something called flashing, um, which, you know, has multiple meanings. Um, but in our case, um, it is uh, metal. And what it does is whenever you have two different levels, two different materials, two different, uh, or transition, um, an opening, it allows any water that may collect on, in that transition to drain out. So it doesn't go in the house. And you can see here he's he's putting up flashing where the upper level of the house meets the the roof there's all kinds of different kinds of flashing they're all names for flashing um this is just a, a you know over here on this building you can see all the different types of flashing eave trim uh sidewall flashing valley end wall flashing and then also over here on the right with the roof uh, this one with the roof tile just shows side flashing, uh, eave flashing, a box barge cover is a, is a form of flashing. And also flashing goes around windows um, to prevent leaks. And 99% of the time, if you see a leak around a door or window, it's because it either was not flashed in the first place, because sometimes people don't flash, um, or it was not flashed properly, or the flashing has failed. Um, and this just shows you, it's just metal. So what happens is, right, say we're getting condensation inside the wall here, or there's a leak and rain is getting in. And what's gonna happen is it's gonna run down and it's gonna hit that flashing. It's gonna come off here and it's gonna drip away. It's not gonna go inside the house or inside the structure. And then after we've, you know, put all these parts and pieces together, we seal the joints. And this is an example of a horrible <laughs> application of joint sealant. Um, I know I'm, I'm mostly showing you guys good applications, but I, I want you to see this is terrible. When you, after you put the joint in, you caulk it out with a gun, you usually they take something like their finger and run it along the joint to create a... A, you know, a, a better bond and a seal and to push it into the crack. Because the goal is to keep the water out of the gap. But also because different materials have expansion and contraction, different expansion and contraction rates. When you have two different materials that come together and here we have wood and brick, they're gonna expand and contract differently. And if the wood sits up against that brick, it could cause that wood to crack. So we leave a little tiny gap, maybe a 16th of an inch, and then we fill it with joint sealant and it's a it's a it's flexible. So it's called elastomeric. And so when the brick and the wood expand and contract at different rates, what's going to happen is they're not going to touch. That that joint is going to absorb that gap and it's going to maintain the uh, integrity of the different materials. And then we have different trims that we use to come back and cover after, you know, we have all these, do all this construction, we put trim over things to hide flashing, to hide gaps, to hide, you know, transitions. And so you can see they're all different kinds of both exterior as well as interior trim. And the trim here is both at the ceiling, um, at the floorboard, um, along the window, and in between the openings of the room where there are, in this case, cased openings. And a cased opening is when there's an opening that has wood around it but does not have a door. 
Um, otherwise, that would be, you know, casing trim around door trim, window trim. Okay, so now we've got the outside ready to go and dry. And then we're going to start putting up drywall on the inside. Um, you'll also hear this referred to as sheetrock. Um, and then drywall is um, a board that is cementitious. And it's got paper on both sides of it. And they, they sc should use screws, to, but they sometimes use nails, but screws will keep it more sound. And they put it over the drywall, I mean over the studs, metal, the wood studs that we put up for our walls. Um, you can put insulation in there, sound attenuation, to keep the sound from going through the wall. Um, but most of the time people don't do that, um, but you can. Um, I have it in my house and I, I recommend it if you can afford it. So you put it, put it up, um, and they come in, um, different size sheets, but generally in different thicknesses, but generally we use half inch drywall in residential applications. Um, and the boards tend to be eight feet, which is the inside of the wall, usually the height of the room by four feet. And then the joints need to be taped. And let's see, I don't think, yeah, I didn't show you guys the tape. It's just this, it looks like tape, but it's actually gotten no adhesive to it. They use the drywall plaster, which is called mud by contractors, to hold the tape in place. And the tape goes over the seams. And you also put mud over the, the screws or the nails. And then it gets smoothed out with a trowel, like you see the guy doing there. And then it gets sanded and then painted. And then it's beautiful. Um, flooring, we put down plywood over the joints, joists. So we've got joists and we can't walk on that. So we'll come back and put down a half inch to five eighths of an inch uh, plywood subflooring before we put down our finished floor. And on the right side, you can see we have uh, uh, hardwood finished floor and carpet and of course there's a whole bunch of different options for finished flooring and we will talk about that in a different class and here is both the three-dimensional view of what we have with the the footing our sill our wall our floor joists um, our sub flooring our wood flooring our trim which is molding here our sheathing is the drywall, there are the studs. So you can see all this coming together now in part of the finished house. And if, again, we were to take this and use it like a rubber stamp on a piece of paper, the bottom right-hand corner is what it would look like. And so you can see, these are just some sections through finished house models. Uh, the one on the left is a is a a physical model made out of looks like cardboard and wood sticks and different materials. The one on the right is is a, a digital model and you all um, are going to be able to build these models in BIM using Revit and then use that model to cut through different sections and areas to build your set of construction documents. And that's it. That is the section, a very brief overview on the dwelling portion of the house, some of the terminology, some of the reasons for doing what we're doing, and um, hopefully that will help you as you're learning to draw these parts and pieces to know what they are, to know why they are, and what should be there. Okay, this, this uh, part will end here.